If you have your Bibles with you, um, friends, I hope you'll open them with me to Judges chapter 17. Um, so the last couple of weeks, we have, well, for the last many months, we've been going through the book of Judges, and just the last few weeks, we've taken a bit of a break, uh, in part because of Palm Sunday and Easter, and then Matthew was preaching for me last week. So we've had a couple of weeks off from Judges, uh, and we pick it back up today. We pick it back up today in chapter 17, which is an interesting turning point in the book of Judges, because up until this point, the book has mostly focused on the leaders of Israel called Judges. And as we see, the, the entire book shows us how the, the pagan culture, the pagan Canaanite culture that surrounds the Israelites, the ones that they should have driven out but they didn't, th this book shows us how that pagan culture corrupts the Israelite culture. We saw for the first 16 chapters how it corrupts the leadership. And we started in the beginning of the book with Othniel, who was the first judge. And Othniel was a relatively good judge, morally, spiritually, um, physically, emotionally, in every way, Othniel was, was a good judge. And then it progressed to Deborah. And then it got worse as it went to Gideon. And even worse as it went to Jephthah. And we, we ended uh, several weeks ago on, on the, the judge of Samson. And Samson was a disaster morally, spiritually, ethically. And so we just, we, we see how Israel has become just this train wreck over, as time has progressed, as, the, as the, the pagan Canaanite culture has crept into the way that Israel's leaders have governed Israel. But chapter 17 here marks a shift because we will no longer hear about any of Israel's judges or their leaders. And I recognize that chapter 17 is actually maybe more important for us than even the previous chapters because 17 begins to focus not on the leadership of Israel, but on the lives of the everyday Israelites. How has a pagan Canaanite culture affected the lives of everyday people? Everyday people like you and me. I say it affects us more because most of the time we're not really worried about how pagan culture is going to affect our public policy because most of us in this room don't have much to do with public policy about how to lead in a, in a public servant kind of way. But we do have everyday Christian lives. And we would be mistaken to assume that the pagan culture we live in doesn't have some influence on that. And, and if we're not guarding against it, I think we can see ways in which that pagan culture can creep in and begin to change and influence who we are. So that's what we're going to look at today in chapter 17. We're going to start in, uh, with a story of a, a man named Micah and his mother. So it's just two, just an everyday Israelite family. And this is a story about things that go on in their lives. And so we're going to start with the first two verses. Let's read there. <clears throat> Judges 17, verse, starting in verses 1 and 2. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. And then his mother said, Yahweh bless you, my son. When he returned, uh, Yahweh bless you, my son. Let me st stop there. So here's the story of a, just an everyday Israelite family. There's a woman, Micah's mother, and she has 1,100 shekels of silver that have been stolen from her, taken. And this is a lot of money, 1,100 shekels. This is probably her IRA, and somebody has stolen it from her. And she has no recourse except just to turn to the Lord, to turn to Yahweh and ask Yahweh for a curse upon whoever took the money from her. Well, as it turns out, her son heard her issue the curse, and he says, uh-oh, I, I don't want the consequences of that curse. So he fesses up to his mom. He says, uh, mom, yeah, um, uh, I took the money from you. I'm sorry about it. Here it is. Here it is. I give it all back. Maybe he's worried about the curse. So in, in return, Micah's mom didn't know that her son was the one that stole the money. Maybe she wouldn't have made the curse if she knew that. But she has issued the curse nonetheless. And so in order to try and counteract that curse, she instead offers a blessing. She wants to bless her son now. But what's interesting to me is that when she blesses her son, she blesses him in the name of the Lord. You see that in all caps, capital L-O-R-D? That's the covenant name of, of God, Yahweh. She blesses him in the name of the one true God, the covenant God of Israel. L let me see if I can po point out what I'm saying. She doesn't bless him in the name of Baal or in the name of Molech or in the name of Asherah. None of the Canaanite gods. She blesses him in the name of Yahweh 
which means at least on the surface level, this family, is, are wor they're worshipers of Yahweh. They want to know and serve Yahweh, not the Canaanite gods. But there are some problems still with this family, and we see them emerging just already in this text, just in these first two verses. First of all, if this is a covenant family of Yahweh, they're, they're worshiping and serving God, why is the Eighth Commandment broken right off the bat? At the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. And yet, here's Micah stealing from his mother. Why is the fifth commandment broken? Honor your father and mother. And here's Micah stealing his mom's retirement account. If this is a family that worships Yahweh, why are they so ignorant or so rebellious against Yahweh's law, against his rules? Makes you think, doesn't it? Makes us think about our own time. Here we live in the Bible Belt. We're in the South, right? This is North Carolina. I know it's not Texas, but this is still Bible Belt, right? And, and so there's this assumption, and it's true. Over half of people, over half of the people in Wilmington, if you were to randomly question them, over half, even still today, would say that they are Christian. Over half. And yet, less than 10% of those people are in worship service on any given Sunday. Now, I know you don't have to go to worship service. I, I can hear it. Oh, pastor, you don't have to go to worship in order to be a true Christian. Well, th that's true. But come on, give me a break. Less than 10%? Less than 10%. What about the divorce rate? The, the divorce rate of non-Christians compared to Christians. What's the difference? You know what it is? No difference. It's the same. Christians are going to mediums and psychics just like the rest of the world the rest of the culture is Christians by almost the same proportions are looking at pornography just like the rest of the world is Christians are are stumbling out of bars on Friday night and Saturday night just like the rest of the world is So what's the difference? What's the difference between Christians and the rest of the world if statistically speaking they're doing the same thing that the rest of the world is doing. They find themselves just like Micah and his mother here. They take the name of the Lord on their lips and yet their lives look no different than the rest of the pagan culture around them. You see that? But what makes a person really Christian then? If it's not simply saying, when someone stops you for a random questionnaire, are you a Christian? Well, yes, I'm a Christian. What really makes them a Christian? What's well, when Jesus is alive in them. When, the, when there's evidence of the Holy Spirit at work alive in their life. When they take the name of Jesus not just as some name on a tombstone marking something that's dead within, but something that is alive in them. And so I invite you to consider today, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, is there evidence of the Holy Spirit of Christ alive at, in, at work in you, separating you, making you different than the rest of the world around you? continue to read verses three to five <clears throat> when he returned the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother she said <clears throat> i solemnly consecrate my silver to yahweh for my son to make an image overlaid with silver i'll give it back to you so after he returned the silver to his mother she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith who used them to make the idol and it was put in micah's house now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some household gods, and he installed one of his sons as his priest. Let me stop there. Again, I think this family has a genuine desire to want to worship Yahweh, to want to worship the covenant God of Israel. In fact, when, when Micah's mom gets the silver back from her son, she sets aside 200 pieces of that silver, and she consecrates it not, again, not to Asherah, not to Baal, not to Molech. She consecrates it to Yahweh. Okay, she, she, this family wants to worship and serve Yahweh. But again, there's some problems. Problem number one. Problem number one is that in the book of Deuteronomy, when God gave the law to Moses, before Israel came into the land of Canaan, God told the Israelites that they are to worship him only in the place that he will show them. And the place that he sets out, the place where the ark resides, the place where the priests make their ministry, that's the place, that's the only appropriate place to worship the Lord. 
And so if you're going to make an offering to the Lord, be it silver or animals or anything, you have to go to that place to make the offering. That doesn't happen here. Instead, Micah's mom makes this offering of silver, and instead of going to the place, which at this point in time was in Shiloh, that's where the ark was, that's where the priests were, but instead of going to Shiloh, she makes an offering simply right there at Micah's house. She make, gives the, the silver to him and says, go ahead, this is an offering to Yahweh. So problem number one is that Micah's mom worships the Lord in an unbiblical place. The second problem is that she worships the, the, the God of Israel through, and in, through unbiblical people. And again, in Deuteronomy and in the book of Numbers, it is set apart that the only ones who are to serve as priests in Israel are the Levites, the, the sons of the tribe of Levi. Now, Micah and his sons are from the tribe of Ephraim. They're not Levites. And yet, what does the text here tell us except that Micah makes his own sons priests? So she worships the, the true God, but she worships him in an unbiblical place, and she worships him through unbiblical people. And the third one, and this is a doozy, is that when she does determine to worship the Lord, she chooses to create an idol. The second commandment tells us this, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in the heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow yourself down to them or worship them. And yet what happens here? Micah's mom gives the silver so that it would be cast into an idol and they would use this idol to worship Yahweh. brings up this topic of idolatry so well before we go to idolatry the three things that are that we see at least three things in this story Micah's family his mom and he worship the God in an unbiblical place through an um, through unbiblical people in an unbiblical way that is idolatry so what's the nature of idolatry a lot of the times when we think about idolatry we think of idolatry as worshiping other gods uh, so we would think that um, <clears throat> you know if somebody's an idolater then they're not worshiping our God they're worshiping some other God but that's not necessarily the case it can be the case but it's not necessarily the case and it's not necessarily the case here because we see that that Micah and his mom want to worship Yahweh they're trying to worship Yahweh by using an idol the same thing was true in the, of the the golden calf the story that we read um, earlier in our Old Testament reading when Moses had delayed being up on the mountain with God the people thought he was never coming back down maybe he uh, tripped and fell off a cliff up there. They don't know what happened to Moses. So they said, well, we got to figure this out on our own. They said, we want to worship Yahweh. So how are we going to do it? Well, gather up your gold. Let's put it in the, in the fire. Let's melt it down. Let's make a golden calf and we'll worship that. But you may say, well, see, they were trying to worship other gods, but that's not true because the very festival that they threw that day was a festival dedicated to Yahweh. They were trying to use the calf to worship Yahweh. See, at that point in time, the Israelites, the, the strongest animal that they could think of pound for pound was a young calf a strong calf and they also knew that their god was a mighty god he had put to shame all the so-called gods of egypt brought them out of egypt and so they said our god is a strong god he's a mighty god how will we represent his strength how will we represent his might and they said i know let's use a calf and so they, they make this calf as a, as a representation of Yahweh's strength. And they worship Yahweh using this calf. And the scripture tells us that the Lord burns in his anger against Israel for doing this. And they think, wait a minute. Why would Yahweh be so angry if these people are trying to honor him by representing their strength? It's a great question. And I think I can answer the question. Have you ever been... Have you ever been on a, on, a, on a boardwalk or in an amusement park and as you're walking down one of the paths you see these artists, they're sitting by the way and they've got the big sketch pad out and if you're willing to sit down for 15 minutes or so and pay 20, 30, 40 bucks, whatever it is now, they'll sketch a picture of you, right? And it's usually a cartoon, it's a funny picture. So they'll, they'll make your head really big and they'll make your body really small. And, and then when they do that, they'll exaggerate your features. So let's say you, you're the kind of person who has a big smile. You're sitting down posing for this, this funny picture. 
and they'll draw you little body big head and they'll draw like 80 percent of your face all teeth because you've got a big picture you've seen that or let's say you've got ears that are you know they're pretty normal ears they're maybe just a little bit bigger than most people's they'll draw you like dumbo the elephant or maybe you have a pointy nose oh guess what you're pinocchio all of a sudden in the so you've seen these caricatures that that these artists draw and they're funny because the people who are with you know you and they know that's not really what you're like that's an exaggeration of who you are but if somebody were trying to understand who you are and that's the only thing they had to go on they would have a gross misrepresentation of who you are wouldn't they now we're getting at the heart of the real problem with idolatry the real problem with idolatry is that it creates an exaggeration of the characteristics and attributes of God an exaggeration over and against God's other attributes and characteristics so whether it be a golden calf or a, or a crucifix that's hung in the sanctuary or whether it be a picture of Jesus in a storybook Bible that we read to our children inevitably when we have an image of God we have a misrepresentation of who he is because we're going to focus in inevitably on some attributes of who he is and therefore misrepresent other characteristics of who he is so we may create an idol that shows God is strong like the calf but then we misrepresent his tenderness God is strong but he's also tender we may misrepresent God as being just he is a just God and indeed he is but he is also merciful how do you show that in a picture or, or we may show God as as transcendent as holy as above us and beyond us and all of that is certainly true but it's also certainly true that he is eminent and he is close close as our own heart how can a statue capture that the answer is it can't all an image or a statue can do is misrepresent who God is and God will not be misrepresented so he says you shall not make for yourself any graven image you, you should not make any idols you know <clears throat> I'm not sure that any of us are planning on taking our silver and casting any idols anytime soon but it's not necessary for us to commit the sin of idolatry idolatry is a sin that begins in the mind it's it's our imagination about who God is so let's get back I'll give you a for example let's get back to um, the question why are most professing Christians not in church on any given Sunday less than 10% of them why is that well I don't know for sure I haven't taken a comprehensive survey but I think I have a pretty good guess I think that they have an idea about who God is uh, they have an understanding about how God looks at their absence from corporate worship on Sunday and and they've come to terms with it so their idea about God is well God understands right God understands I like worship sometimes but I can't make it there every Sunday wink wink nudge nudge God gets it right he knows my time in the boats important he knows I got to work on my swing when else am I gonna do that I got to get out to get my 18 holes in God understands these things surely he's the sort of God that gets these things but what we've created in our mind to justify our absence is a God who is is tolerant and lackadaisical about the worship the corporate worship of his holiness it is also not a God who is revealed at all in the scriptures the scriptures tell us in Exodus chapter 20 verse 16 oh I'm sorry Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 16 they rejected my laws and did not follow my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths for their hearts were devoted to their idols if you think God takes corporate worship and our regular attendance there to be in the company of the Saints lightly then you're worshiping a God who is an idol not the God displayed in the Bible Similarly, we, we think about our giving and we think all of us if we're Christians We have just determined to set aside a certain portion of our financial um, Our financial gifts to give to the work of the Lord um, physically here on earth and uh, some of us Are pretty regular in that and some of us we um, there are some months where we don't give as much as we had intended to give We had devoted ourselves to give and we think again. Yeah, God understands, right? 
God knows that that 70 inch TV, it went on sale this month. Who knows if it's going to be on sale next month? I got to buy it now. God understands that if I can't put it quite as much in the plate as I'd intended. But is that the scripture? Is that, is that, is that a God of our imagination? Or is that the God of the scriptures? The God of the scriptures says this in Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Now, I can just see it. You're sitting there and you're asking me this, right? Okay, pastor, then what are we to do to avoid idolatry? I guess that means we're supposed to stop skipping church and start putting more money in the plate. Well, you said it, not me, right? <laughs> but let me tell you this, even that, even that way of thinking can sort of become an idol for us if we have this checklist of things to do, of rules to follow, that can become an idol for us. And there are many people who live their lives that way, thinking that if I will just follow all of God's rules, check, 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 then things will go well for me. And then when things don't go well, we find people who become despondent. We find people who become uh, bitter about God because they think, well, listen, I did all the things I was supposed to do and things didn't happen the way that I thought they should happen. But you know what that is? That's, an, that's not God. That's not a relationship. That's an idol. That's, that's a vending machine. You put in the right amount of money and you push the right button and you get what comes out. But that's not God. That's not the God of the Bible who wants a relationship with us. That's a, a mechanical sort of um, understanding of who God is, and it is ultimately an idol. Now, we, we obey God's laws not in order to get something from God, but we obey God's laws as a response to a, a loving relationship we have with him. And so, so, for instance, we, we worship God and serve him only because we know who he is. Not in order to know who he is, but because we know who he is, we worship our God and we serve him only. We, we honor his Sabbath days. Why? Not to get something, but because we love him. We, we, we don't run around on each other's spouses and we don't steal from each other and we don't kill each other and we don't covet each other's stuff because the God who loves us has told us that this is best for you and we believe him. We don't follow the rules in order to get things but because is born out of our relationship of love with the Lord. There are so many people in our culture, in our world, who have this idea of, of idolatry. You can even hear it if, as you talk to your, um, your Christian friends, and they'll say, well, you know, my God doesn't require me to do this or that, or, you know, I don't think God would judge this person or that person in that sort of way. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you, and I, I hope I'm not the only one that's ever honest with you about this, but um, it's countercultural for me to say this. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you believe God is like. What does matter is what God has said he is like, how God has revealed himself in his word. If we don't want to worship an idol of our imagination, then we must go back to the Bible and see how he has revealed himself to be. And specifically, it's, it's not our imaginations that lead us to understand who God is, how we imagine he might be, but it is God's word, and specifically, God's word concerning who Jesus Christ is. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he says to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That if we want to worship the true and living God, the first and, and primary thing we are to do is to look to Jesus, to look to how he is revealed to us in his word, and there we see who God truly is in the person of Jesus Christ. Last verse today, verse six. <clears throat> in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. A better translation of this, some of yours might read more like this way if you're reading something other than the NIV, is that in those days Israel had no king, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And I wonder if we might make that, put a little bit of a, a point on that and say it this way. 
in our time, Christians have no Christ. Everyone does as they see fit. I wish that weren't true, but it's becoming increasingly so. As we look to the Western church in America in particular, and we see that the church evermore has um, the ethics of the culture, the pagan culture around us. We see, as far as justice is concerned, the, the church has adopted the culture's idea of what justice looks like. The church has adopted the, the world's idea of what worship ought to look like. You ever go to a concert, a rock concert? You ever go to some of these churches? Can you tell the difference? You, the, we ask the question, well, what about sexual ethics? Well, that too, right? The, the church is beginning to adopt the sexual ethics of the culture around us. In our time, Christians have no Christ. Everyone does as they see fit. Let me put a little bit more of a finer point on this and ask this in your own life, your personal life. Do you live your life with the ethic of doing whatever it is you see fit? Do you do what's right in God's eyes or do you simply live day in and day out doing what's right in your own eyes? Now, I hope that's not true for us as a church or you as an individual. And, and I think, by and large, Windermere is not, but we have to acknowledge that we do live in this culture and we are a part of the Western church. And so we have to take some responsibility and ask, do I live my life doing what's right in my own eyes? Maybe some of you are Christians and you've fallen into that. Maybe some of you have never professed Christ, either here or maybe watching us online, and you've never professed Christ, and so you have always lived your life doing what you see fit. Let me ask you this. How's it going for you? Yeah, I don't, I don't pretend to need to prescribe anything to you. If life, if you do, if you're living life just as you see fit, what's right in your own eyes, and things are going swimmingly for you, right? You're just, you're productive in your work, in your family life, and your life is being fulfilled, and you're happy and content, then I don't need to offer you anything. You're fine, right? I, I don't need to convince you of anything at all, if that's the way you live. But here's what I think has happened, because I used to live the way I wanted and, and what I saw fit in my own eyes. And I can tell you just from experience that in the end, eventually, sooner or later, it catches up to you and you realize that your life is ultimately broken and empty and dark. And if you're at that point today, I want to offer you some hope, the hope of the gospel, in fact. It is, it is not to turn to a, a sort of God of our imaginations. Sometimes people don't turn to God because they have this concept of who God is that's totally unbiblical. I'm not asking you to turn to an unbiblical version of God, something you've imagined. Sometimes people have a trouble turning to God because they see it as a set of rules. So I come into the church and I'm going to have to follow all these rules and, and change my life to meet all these sorts of standards. But that too is an idol. I'm not asking you to turn to your imagination or to a set of rules. What, the good news of the gospel is that God calls us to turn to a person to the person of Jesus Christ because in him all the fullness of God is displayed in all its grace in all his truth I invite you to turn to Jesus if, if living your life as you see fit in your own eyes has not worked for you if you have not lived with a king over your life let me invite you into relationship with the king the one who died for you the one who rose for you, the one who even now intercedes for you. When you turn to him today, whether it be for the first time or in a new way, you can know that you've been forgiven and you can know that in him there's eternal life. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we don't need to turn to idols, that you've given us Jesus. We, we do have a, a, a tangibility problem, Lord. We want so desperately to be able to touch God, to, to see him, to know him. And so that's why we have created idols in the past. But Lord, in your mercy, you have sent us one that one day we will touch and we will see and we will hug and we will embrace. You've sent us Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that, that we can worship the true and living God in and through him our Savior Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. In his name we pray. Amen.